But I think we should have this discussion a year from now. Let's let's decide that. We do this on the 17th of April 2021. Hello and welcome. You're watching Lockdown TV from Unheard. So 12 months ago, we aired an interview with Professor Johan Giesecker from Sweden, the former state epidemiologist, uh, which, fair to say, shook the whole global debate around lockdowns. It's been viewed nearly 1.5 million times. And in it, he claimed that lockdowns were the wrong policy um, and a Swedish approach would be wiser. So that at that stage was controversial. Um, he promised to come back 12 months later and discuss how it all went. And I'm delighted to say he joins us now from Sweden. Hello, Professor Giesecke. Hello, Fred. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. And in the same uh, beautiful Swedish room that you were <laughs> in last time. Yes, it's the same room, yes. So let's just start, if we can, by I've got a couple of clips of things you told us back then 12 months ago. And I'd like to see what your reaction is and, and what your explanation is for what's happened since, if that's OK. OK. Um, so let's start with clip one. I think we should have this discussion a year from now. Let's, let's decide that. We do this on the 17th of April 2021. Mm. I think that the difference between countries would be quite small in the end. So that you don't think that the severity of the, these intervening measures are going to make that much difference? No, I don't think so. so I think, actually, should I tell you what I really think? Please. I, I almost never do this. I think what we're seeing is a tsunami of a usually quite mild disease, which is sweeping over Europe. And some countries do this, and some countries do that, and some countries do, don't do that. And in the end, there would be very, very little difference. So it won't make much difference, uh, you said. It seems like countries' outcomes are still enormously different. Um, what, what do you say to that, seeing that clip back? I agree. One of the things I got wrong a year ago is the rate of spread of this disease. I thought it would spread quicker, and I also thought it would be more similar in different countries. We can see now that there are big differences in the rate of spread in between countries. It may have to do with lockdown, it may have to do with cultural things in these countries. But uh, there is, like you say, a big difference between countries, uh, especially if we just look at Europe. Sweden has now become one of these countries where everyone has a chart if they want to make it look successful, and everyone has a chart if they want to make it look like a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and the chart that is most commonly shared if you want to make Sweden look bad is a comparison with its neighboring Scandinavian countries, which to most people seem totally fair enough. You see that Sweden's death per million, which started higher, just continued to get higher and higher than the other Scandinavian countries. Denmark also suffered some deaths, but neither Norway nor Finland really ever got uh, substantial amounts of deaths. What, just thinking within Scandinavia, what is your explanation for that huge difference? I'm not sure that anyone can explain this properly, but the similarities between Sweden and its neighbors are much bigger, the, much, the differences are much more bigger than seen from the outside. The different systems, different uh, cultural traditions. Uh, there are other things that explain uh, the difference in death rate between the countries. And if you compare Sweden to other European countries, it's the other way around. Uh, on the ranking list of deaths or excess mortality, Sweden is somewhere in the middle or below the middle of European countries. So I think it's really Norway and Finland that are the outliers more than Sweden. And so when you talk about other cultural factors, what what do you mean? Why would it be that Norway and Finland have escaped so much? I don't know. They're more sparsely populated. There are less people per square kilometer in these two countries. There are much fewer people who were born outside Europe in, who live in these two countries. Uh, there are a number of factors. But this will be, Fred, this will be years of research for the future to try to uh, elucidate where the difference comes from. But one factor we do know was different was that they were much stricter than Sweden 
in shutting the border earlier um, and they shut the schools earlier and all of the schools um, and they had some form of mandatory lockdowns which Sweden never did. I mean that seems to be the most obvious explanation. Do you agree with it? It may be the most obvious but that doesn't mean it's true. It's to some extent what epidemiologists call the ecological fallacy when you compare uh, countries like this without looking at the individuals in them. But we won't get into that. But there are other, there are other reasons. So like I said, the next five, 10 years will be used by researchers to try to explain the difference. So do you think that had Sweden followed the same path as Denmark and Norway, which was to close the borders very quickly, shut down society more forcibly and keep it there, they would have a result more similar to those neighboring countries now? Maybe not. I think we would still have more deaths than they have. So if we look at this chart, which shows the current cases per million of all the European countries, this is a chart that's often shared at the moment in the UK because we are at the bottom of it, highlighted in red. Uh, and Sweden is at the top of it. It looks like there are more cases per million in Sweden than in any other country at the moment. Why is that happening? That, that's changing from week to week, from month to month. Uh, a month ago, we were number 10 from the right on that one. And next month, you don't know. Um, one thing that I think is central to our discussion here, Fred, is I don't think you should compare countries now when we're still in the pandemic. We should wait until the pandemic has receded quite a lot before we start comparing countries. So if you did this graph, I think a month ago, it would be very different. And a month from now, I don't know, but it could still be very different. So I, these uh, snapshots uh, may not show the whole truth. So are you now making another date with us, Yuan? When are we gonna, this is a year <laughs> since our first discussion. When yes. can we actually judge whether your advice was right or wrong? Uh, sometimes I feel that way. Maybe when I said a year from now, that was too, uh, should I said five years from now. But I think, again, this graph changes from, from month to month. Let's look at a couple more and then we'll, we'll leave the graphs alone, because I think they show the complexity of this situation, that if we show a comparison of the UK and Sweden um, over time, this is the number of deaths per million over time, you see quite an interesting thing, which is that if you zoom out for the whole period of the 12 months, the shapes are very similar. They're very similar. And yet one of the countries had had three severe lockdowns and the other has only had voluntary or mostly voluntary measures. Um, that tells you something, I think. What does it tell you? That lockdowns may not be a very useful tool in the long run. Let's look at one more slide, which, which shows the current situation. Our paths as countries, the UK and Sweden, have now diverged quite dramatically, in terms of cases at least. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers are now very, very low in the UK, and there seems to be something of a third wave or a, a new spike going on in Sweden. What is your explanation for that divergence? One explanation is that uh, the, well, the English strain, the English mutation, you shouldn't use that term, but everyone knows what I mean, has been spreading very fast in Sweden during the last month, two months or so. Uh, and that has created quite a steep rise in, in Sweden. Do you think it's also the vaccine? Probably also the vaccine. You vaccinated quite a larger part of your population than Sweden has. Yeah. What you do see from the vaccines in Sweden is that death rate in, especially in old people, has fallen dramatically over the last month. And why is that? Because of the vaccines. So you talked about how we might need to leave it another year or so until we reach the end. Aren't we at the end, nearly? I mean, if everybody is rolling out these vaccines, is this not very soon the end of the story? Mm, hopefully. 
but we'll see how long it takes and then how many people for example do not want to take the vaccine uh, that the vaccine exists will not uh, exterminate the disease i'm going to show one final um, ranking for you which i think is interesting um, which shows sweden and the uk highlighted in total as the number of deaths per million over the course of the last year and you see sweden as at today middle of may is 23rd in the world but the united kingdom is 11th in the world so as a yeah. net result uh, sweden is still in a better position than the uk yes but could it have been nearer norway denmark finland in after 100 or more positions down the chart that's really the question could have maybe uh, but I still think what I said, that it's really Norway and Finland, not so much Denmark, but Norway and Finland who are the real outliers in, in the European situation. I've got a clip to play you uh, from our first interview when we started talking about fatality rates and what percentage of the population you felt at the time, this was April 2020, had already had the disease. Let's have a look. Have you made any speculations as to what sort of um, zone the real fatality rate might be in? Uh, I think it will be like a severe influenza season, the same as uh, which would be a, on an order of 0.1% maybe. So that would suggest then for a country like the UK that has already had, is heading towards 20,000 deaths, that would suggest that millions, many millions of people have already had it. Yes. And you believe, is, do you think that is also true in Sweden then, that a, that a substantial percentage of the population has had it? Yep. I'm rather certain on that, actually. What sort of percentage of the population do you think we will discover has had it once, once we get mass antibody testing in place? At least half. In the United Kingdom, or do you mean in Sweden as well? Both countries. So, Dr. Giesecke, looking back at that, were those claims wrong? Yes. <clears throat> there are two things I really got wrong. There are probably more things, smaller things that I also got, but two big things. One is that the vaccine came so fast. I had no idea, no, and most people didn't, I think, uh, that we would have vaccine within a year, less than a year of the first cases. That's one thing. The other is rate of spread. I overestimated the rate of spread. I thought it would spread much easier faster uh, than it did and also that it would be more similar between countries because it isn't like you said at the start here so that's two things that i got wrong so you thought it had already spread through a big chunk maybe yeah. half or more and in fact we had a very low fatality rate but actually it had only spread through a small proportion and it had a higher fatality rate yep here you we have to become a bit technical here because you use the word case fatality rate or case fatality, yeah. Or infectious fatality rate. Or infectious. Uh, and that is the number of diagnosed cases who die, the proportion of diagnosed cases who die. Uh, then we have a number of people who have the disease but who are not diagnosed and not counted in the statistics. If you add them, the fatality rate goes down. What I was talking about a year ago was mortality, which is what part of the population, of the entire population, dies from the disease. And for Sweden, it is now about 14,000 dead in a population of 10 million. So it's 0.14% of the population. And that's the measure you usually use. When you talk about the Black Death, you say that 30% of the population died. When you talk about the Spanish flu, you say that it killed 1% of the population. And that's the mortality figure that I use, which is slightly different, but quite a lot different from the infectious fatality rate. Because the, I, when I asked about the IFR, the infection fatality rate, the, and uh, I thought that's what you answered. Okay, then I was wrong. So the reason everybody gets so upset about this um, is that if you add those mistaken judgments together, the IFR or the how, how fatal, how dangerous the disease was, 
with how far it had spread and indeed how quickly the vaccine would come, you add them up and that becomes quite a very a grave difference. And it means that your advice to recommend a, a more liberal strategy because there was nothing we could do about it and it had already passed through the population would have led to a very different result. I mean, do you now, adding up those errors together, do you now feel that your overall advice was wrong? No. And the reason is that Sweden had a rather severe restrictions, but we based them on voluntary participation by the inhabitants instead of using laws and police. A lot of people in the world seem to think that Sweden did nothing about the COVID pandemic. That's wrong. I mean, the entire population changed their way of living. It had profound effects on daily life for millions of Swedes, uh, even though you didn't know you weren't fined if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I still think that the Swedish uh, model uh, had, uh, I would still advocate that, even in knowing all that you said just now. So a year ago, I asked you, do you think the negative impact of lockdowns will be greater than the positive benefit? And you said yes. Do you still have that view? Well, you can look at what's happened in Sweden, that the good things with the Swedish system. One is the schools, that we're not destroying the future for years classes of, of the children. One is that Sweden kept to the international agreements, for example, in the European Union, you shouldn't close the borders towards your neighbors, which has happened in several countries in Europe. I think we have uh, made it possible for a small business like cafes or bicycle repair shops or whatever to survive the pandemic. Uh, we have kept democracy. Uh, we've trusted people. I think there are a number of benefits by not having a severe lockdown. And more of them will come as, as we do research on this in the future. So in other words, even if it's meant more people have died, there are benefits to wider society that you think are more important? Well, they should be compared at least somehow. Because at the time we were, one of the things we discussed was Neil Ferguson's report, which back in April last year was quite fresh and you described it as not very good and you were quite critical of his report which forecast up to 500 deaths in 500,000 deaths in the UK if we had no measures or might come down to 250,000 if we used a mitigation strategy and he hoped it would come down to 20,000 deaths if we did full lockdowns and a so-called suppression strategy we're now at 130,000 deaths in the UK his numbers don't look so wrong anymore, do they? Um, no. I think you may be right. I mean, there's quite a difference between half a million and 130,000. Um, yeah. So, so is it, would it be fair to say then that on the science, you concede that you got some things wrong and you, Neil Ferguson may have been right. But on the principle of whether lockdowns are the right policy, you still think you got it right? Yeah. We've got a clip of talking about lockdowns um, from our last interview. But how long in a democracy do you think it will keep a lockdown? How long will it take before people say, no, I'm not taking it? You can do it in China. In China, you can do it. You can tell people to stay at home and you can weld back their doors so they can't get out. But in a democracy, you can't. And after <clears throat> three, four weeks, people will say, well, I don't know anyone who had the COVID and I haven't met and I want to go out. I want to go down to the pub. So that is a quite a relevant clip for today because in fact, just yesterday or earlier this week in the UK, pubs were allowed to open again for outside only. The thing that's surprised me, and it looks like might have surprised you, is that that prediction didn't happen. People didn't get tired of it. These lockdowns remained popular throughout the last 12 months in countries across Europe. What's your reflection on that? I agree. That's also a surprise. I thought people would protest more, and they are protesting in many countries in Europe. 
against the lockdown. Uh, but I agree that people were more uh, accepting than I thought they would be. Than, uh, you know, you talk about um, China welding people in. Yeah. We had, uh, for example, Jeremy Hunt, who is a former health secretary and senior conservative, talking about that positively as, a, as something we should look to for inspiration um, earlier in this pandemic. So the whole conversation has, is, has changed, hasn't it? Um, and people's expectations seems very different to what they were 12 months ago. People were prepared or willing to uh, give up more freedom than I thought they would be. And is that something that worries you? Yes, it worries me. Uh, because there are many democratic rules, uh, freedom that has been curtailed in the, uh, and I think that may be the, one of the dangerous results of this pandemic. I mean, looking back at the interview we did a year ago, that was something where I say you were, you were quite prescient in that you described how difficult it would be to unravel and to get out of once people took this path. And here we are 12 months later and we are still in it and how it might have serious political ramifications. Yep. What, what's happening in Sweden on that front? I mean, it used to be unconstitutional to lock down the country. Uh, they've changed the constitution, have they not? Now, there's a new law, the pandemic law, which gives uh, the government more power than it had before. And which, uh, like I said, curtails part of the freedom of the Swedish population. And it is being debated uh, if this is human rights PC. Are you against it? Yes, at least part of, parts of it. We won't get into detail, but I think yeah, uh, it's shifted power away from, for example, from Parliament to some extent, uh, which is a new thing in Sweden, at least in peacetime. You mentioned the damage done by lockdowns, and I agree we should spend some time on that because we talked about how the full um, results of the pandemic in terms of measurable deaths and cases are not yet clear 100% because it's not over yet. Uh, but the full results of the lockdowns are not clear either. I mean, what, what is your sense of that? What, what do you think we will discover in future years as the impact of these measures? And that's what I call the side effects of lockdowns. We talk about the side effects and the adverse effects of the vaccines, but we haven't talked that much about the adverse effects of, of the lockdown. Uh, and it's too early to guess what they might be. But I think this thing with, with a lot of children missing large part of the school year will have important ramifications for the future. And that's something that Sweden never did, right? They never shut the schools for younger people. Up to 16 were open, yes, and kindergarten. Do you look at that as a success? Because yes. other, other countries have now, for example, the Prime Minister of Norway says she regrets closing schools, mm -hmm. um, and other countries have not closed schools during subsequent lockdowns, whilst the UK did. Yep. Do you think that should now be a principle? Yes. I so, think you don't, so. so you don't think you gain enough in the fight against the epidemic to justify closing schools? Oh, well, that's for the future to decide, Fred, if it was worth it or not. And it will always be a discussion, I think. But uh, uh, like I said, using the term adverse effects of the pandemic, of the lockdown, uh, should be studied closely before we make any final decision for the future, for example. Social distancing? That was in your list of things that you said there wasn't much evidence for a year ago. Do you now feel that social distancing is a good policy to use in an epidemic? Yes, I think that's a, it's a small, uh, what's the English word, a small uh, effect Price? on people, people's lives. 
that you don't uh, hug, that you don't shake hands, that you stay a bit from each other. I think that was a good. Uh, and that's one thing which has really worked very well without any laws or police. So if we look at where we are now, uh, Professor Giesecke, um, what's going to happen next? When do you feel like this will actually end properly? Well, the virus will not disappear from the world. The virus has come to stay and we won't, we won't be able to exterminate it uh, for the future. So uh, different things may ha happen. Uh, the virus may mutate, so it becomes less uh, pathogenic than it is now. Uh, it may be that it comes back in new shape every autumn. And it may be that we'll all have to take a vaccine every year now, a new corona vaccine, uh, which is tailored for that year's strain, just like for influenza. Um, that might happen. But it has come to stay. The virus is here to stay. We won't get rid of it. Let's hope that the summer brings very low numbers in combination with the vaccine. Would you like to see all restrictions lifted across Europe? I think English, England is doing us the right way by lifting one at a time and see what happens. I think that's not a bad idea. You lifted yesterday, wasn't it? the pubs, for example, and schools, for example. Um, yes, that would be my advice. And take away one restriction, see what happens, wait a couple of weeks, and then maybe take the next one over a couple of months or so. But with the aim of getting back to full, old-fashioned normal? Yes, if it ever happens. Well, do you, should, think, do, should you it? Think, do you think people will stop shaking hands after this? I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I don't think so. I don't think so. No, me neither. And like about... I said before in interviews, I think 20 to 30 years from now, people will have forgotten the most about this pandemic. It will be old and, and not the influence policy very much any longer. Two, three decades from now. Well, I'd love to say we should book in a, another interview three decades from now, but uh, who knows where we'll be there. What about masks? You might be there, but I won't be there. What about masks, Professor Giesecke? Is that something that you now think is a good idea during epidemics? Or where do you stand on masks? I think it has, it may have a small additional effect, but it's not the, uh, the silver bullet, no. So do you think we should be continuing to use them in trains and public spaces in the future after this epidemic is over? Or do you think we should go back to never seeing them. Let people do what they want to do about that, I think. I don't think you should have a law about it, but if people want to use a mask, they should certainly be allowed to do that. I've got another um, little question for you, which is, what about seasonality? This is oh. another thing people get very upset about. Some people say that it's underexplored and some people say that it's overemphasized. What's your view? It, how much of the last year's movements can be explained by simply the weather? I think quite a lot. I used to think this was, wasn't true, the thing about weather and winter and winter diseases. But I'm changing that. There is some factor in the season. That's clear. For many of the respiratory viruses, not just COVID, um, I'm not sure if it's the weather or temperature or that we have different mixing habits when, when it's cold outside. Uh, but there is some external factor as well that influences. I think there is a seasonality, yes. Does that mean it will come back in the winter? If it comes back, it will come back in, in, uh, in the winter, yes. I watched an interview you did on Swedish television, I think it was last week, um, when you were talking about how vaccinated people should behave. And I wonder if you can explain your view. Once you've been vaccinated with double jab and you've waited the period after that, how do you think you should behave? I think you should behave like normal, like before the pandemic. If you are vaccinated two doses, you wait the number of weeks, then you are immune and you are not infectious and uh, you should be able to, to live like you did before the pandemic. Because there's nothing, there's nothing 
this disease is something sometimes seen as a, something supernatural, mystical, mystical. It's a viral disease like all other viral diseases. It's more dangerous than some of them, uh, but it's not something unique, the, the COVID, like it's something. So proper vaccine used correctly protects you and means that you don't infect other people as well. So this talk of we don't yet know how much transmission is reduced by vaccines, and that's the reason why in America, you know, Dr. Fauci says he will still not go to a busy cinema theater, even though he's been vaccinated. Do you think it's just over caution or why are people talking like that? I don't know really, Fred, why. But I think it's a bit over caution because you don't do that if you get a, an influenza vaccine in October. You don't go around telling other people, keep out my way because I might be infectious. I mean, no vaccine is, that, that's a caveat. No vaccine is 100% effective. But, but we don't have this discussion that we're having now about any other vaccine. You've taken the vaccine, have you? Yes, I had my first jab last week and uh, the next one would be in a month or a couple more. Is this the AstraZeneca? Yes, this is AstraZeneca. Uh, are you worried about blood clots as a potential side effect? Not much, no. And you would recommend everyone takes the vaccine? Yes, I think everyone should take the vaccine. What about young people? Well, if we really want to get down this disease to small numbers, like you said, we won't eradicate it, but to small numbers, then I think even children should be vaccinated, yes. So you think there's a, a medical case to vaccinate children, even though they're not? at risk from it? Well, they are there is. some serious disease in small children, in children as well, even if it's very rare. Um, I can't see why not, no. Looking back over the last year, you've also had quite a turbulent time in the Swedish media. Um, after our interview, you've done a number of interviews um, and you've been criticised What's your reflection on the past year? I mean, has it been worth it for you? Uh, worth it. I hope I have done some useful things for the Swedish population. Um, if it's been useful for me or not. I don't know um, how interesting it is to viewers, but the discussion in Sweden has been very politicized and very di divisive. There are two camps that are uh, having a debate which is not very scientific and very personal. That may be true for other countries as well. I'm not. I think that's okay. definitely true for yeah. other countries. Um, we had um, a man called Fredrik Elg, yeah. um, a epidemiologist from the north of Sweden, on this show, and he was very anxious at Christmas. He felt, I think the quote was that Sweden was headed for disaster at that point and was very keen that more restrictions would come in. Um, do you feel like that disaster happened? No, I don't think so. I think we're going, we have many cases, but we have few deaths and that's the important bit, I think. And you're not worried about the ICU capacity and there were, there were taught stories that it was reaching 100% and you were going to have to call on help from neighboring Finland and so on. Did, did that happen? That was, some time, that was some time ago. I mean, it could, have, it could still happen. Uh, the healthcare system is stretched by COVID. I shouldn't underestimate that. It, it is uh, people are working hard and long hours and they, got, they get their vacations canceled and so on. Um, but I don't think we are heading towards a disaster. So what would your prognosis now be? Do you think that this current peak will, will turn around and that will be the last peak for Sweden? Or what, what do you think is happening next? We hope so. I, I can't really predict, but uh, I hope so. So if you think about um, the world as it was when we last spoke a year ago, this was all very new. And I think in retrospect, you were pretty much talking about the, the standard 
epidemiology line, which was that these kind of uh, respiratory diseases can't be contained and therefore they need to be mitigated, was basically what you were saying. It, it now looks like that whole received wisdom has changed and people have now proven that a highly infectious respiratory disease can be contained or suppressed with stringent enough measures and that that is now going to be best practice for how to deal with epidemics. Do you think that's fair? I don't agree with you because it can't be contained. And, and like I think we discussed a year ago, there are only two ways to stop a respiratory tract infection like this one, either to get herd immunity or by a vaccine. And now we have the vaccine. Um, so I don't think that the, using the non-medical action will stop the disease. What I said a year ago was that you could press it down, you could flatten the curve, but you cannot eradicate the disease without one of these two things happening. But that will now be considered by most people as best practice, won't it? If a new virus happens, you suppress it as much as you can, flatten the curve, as you put it, in the expectation that there will then be a new vaccine developed for it soon. Is that the new normal we're going to live in now for future diseases? Could be that, uh, um, that you do everything you can to press down the disease and, and wait for the vaccine. I'm still not. Uh, sure that lockdowns are the best way to do that, but uh, it could be the new normal, yes. But does that, how do you feel about that? I mean, that's potentially, you know, we talked about next 10 or 20 or 30 years, that we could be spending the next 10 years going in and out of various forms of suppressed viruses for new variants, new viruses, new pathogens of different kinds. Is that something that you would accept? Mm. Accept or expect? Either. <laughs> uh, I mean, epidemics like pandemics like these open, happen infrequently. No, I don't think that would be the new normal. No. So you think we're going to get the old normal back? After some time, yes. But it's interesting to speculate how this pandemic will change the world and then change the way we behave. I can't really predict, but you're right. It will have some effect, even though that will uh, uh, taper out after five, 10, 20 years, I think. Because a lot of people online and a lot of people that uh, on YouTube are very anxious that this change that we just talked about a more centralized, more controlled treatment of things like viruses is part of a bigger shift towards more digitized, and more controlled, more centralized existences where the state plays a much bigger and more powerful role in all of our lives. I mean, do you think that's over the top or do you have some sympathy with that? It sounds like it's over the top, but now Fred, we're leaving my my area of expertise and getting more into social sciences, I think I couldn't predict. Okay, is there, is there anything that you want to put on the record, Yuan, in terms of what you got right, what you got wrong, and how you'd like people to remember your contribution to this debate? I think it was this insight that I had in, in March, April, that this was a disease that would spread across the globe and which would create many cases of, of uh, disease and many deaths until we had the vaccine. No, I, I, I think I got most of the things right, actually. Okay, Professor Yuan Giseke, thank you so much. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Well, should we make another another date? Do you think, or is this an annual <laughs> annual catch up? Yeah, we, yeah. Okay, why not? Mid April next year. Yeah. Well, we'll see you then. Okay. See you. Then. Thank you. That was Professor Yuan Giseke, the former Swedish state epidemiologist, 
Uh, the man who 12 months ago in April 2020 pretty much kicked off the global anti-lockdown movement with his extraordinary interview with us here at Unheard, in which he claimed that the whole direction the world was taking at that crucial moment was wrong. He promised to come back and there he did. He looked quite candidly back at the past 12 months and with his typical uh, to the point answers, he confessed that he got some things wrong particularly on the science, but on the bigger principle of whether lockdowns were right, he still feels he got the big things right. So thanks to him for taking part and for having the bravery to come back and face the music after such a long time. And thanks also to you for tuning in. This was Lockdown TV.